All right. Um, I am so happy to introduce this new panel, um, the second panel for uh, today. Um, it is going to be a great discussion, um, and um, I can't wait to uh, can't wait to hear it. So this is rewriting the code: uh, women, law, and technology. And um, I'd love to introduce our panelists uh, today. Our panelists include Vanessa Candela, uh, who is Chief Legal Officer with Salonis. Hi, Vanessa. So good to see you. Hi, good to be here. Fellow, fellow class of 2000. <laughs> We're representing. That's great. Yep. Um, also, my pleasure to introduce Juliana Spofford. Uh, she is class of 89, and she uh, is general counsel and chief privacy officer at Identified. Hi, Juliana. Nice to see you. Hey, everyone. Good to be here. Um, also, my pleasure to introduce Alicia Tambay. She's class of 2015, and she is the public policy manager, global connectivity and access for Facebook. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, nice to see you. Thanks for uh, being here. And uh, moderating the panel today uh, is Jessica Silby. Um, my pleasure to introduce her. She is a professor of law at uh, Boston University. Hi, everyone. All right, Jessica, Great. I'm turning it over to you. Great, all right. Um, uh, what uh, Amy didn't say is I was uh, formerly a professor at, uh, at Northeastern University School of Law as well, where I was the director of the Center for Law innovation and creativity for five years, and it was to um, to build that and work with um, students and faculty and staff. Um, so I am really grateful to be here and have this conversation about tech law and um, uh, working in tech law um, and working on diversity and inclusion and equity issues within um, within the tech law space. So we, as a panel, have um, talked about a bunch of questions that we wanted to um, discuss with all of you that hopefully will spark some questions from the audience. So we'll we'll um, I'm going to engage in the Q and A with the panelists for about. Um, you have 45 minutes and then open it up to questions. But if people have questions, um, interventionist questions in the chat, I will be monitoring that as well. And we'll try to include that in the conversation as we go. So uh, the, first, um, the first thing we wanted to um, open up the conversation about was about how tech law is often mischaracterized um, as male oriented. Um, because uh, maybe because it's computer science -y or engineering, none of which are inherently gendered, of course, um, but that there is this misperception that tech law is gendered in some way. And so um, one of the things we talked about as a group was um, how to overcome that misperception as a leader in one's company, as a, as a lawyer in the company. And, um, and um, and how to promote professional development in the field that um, that can fight that misperception. So that's the first question: um, is about um, uh, how do you how do you break down those barriers of the gendered idea of tech law being male? So who um, who wants to go first? I think maybe Juliana. We were going to start with you. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to address that one. Um, I want to start off by saying. It's great to be here. And it's a hard act to follow all these amazing speakers that have come before. But there are two things that you have to remember when we're talking about women and technology. The first is you don't need a tech background to get into you know, companies, tech, tech type of companies, okay? So that I was an art history major <laughs> and here I am, you know, chief privacy officer and general counsel for a tech startup. And I've done it multiple times at this point. So remember that. What you do need is um, the attitude that you wanna learn, that you wanna understand everything about what's going on in that company, okay? And we as lawyers, I think are, really uniquely situated to be able to take on that role because we've been taught how to think, but we've also been taught how to ask questions. 
And it's fundamental, whatever company you're in, whatever firm you work for, to understand the technology and the data flows in your company, because otherwise you just can't practice law anymore in this day and age. I have to, I have to say it because everything you do touches these days on data and technology. Um, so I, I kind of want to say that it's, it's okay to educate yourself and not run in the other direction. Please, please get, you know, you don't need a seat at the management table to understand what your company does. Um, and in fact, one of my best employees that I ever hired, uh, was, was a guy who kind of came to me and said, listen, you know, and he was maybe three years out of law school. He's like, you know, I haven't been a privacy attorney before, but I, I, I really want to understand how this company works. And he asked the questions. He asked the questions of everyone within the company. And, you know, you want to be that business partner. So, so I will say that, um, you know, from, a, from my perspective, it's all about getting to know your firm or your company. That's a great answer, Julianne. I, I remind myself that I, I have a PhD in um, comparative literature, but my first job as a lawyer was working on a big patent case, a big <laughs> um, biotech patent case. And I de definitely felt like um, ex excellent litigators were just great storytellers, to be honest. And you had to know your, you know your client's work, but once you did that, you could, you could prevail um, without having been a scientist. Um, who wants to answer the, uh, address this question next? Um, I can add to that. I think that it's really, really important. I completely agree with um, Juliana in the sense that we are lawyers, whether you know we're working on the legal team or policy teams, but by only interacting with lawyers, you're doing yourself a disservice. And I think it's really important to go into other avenues and different departments in your company. I know at at Facebook, it's really crucial to interact with the engineers and to interact with people on different teams. We have these, for each problem that you're solving. It can't just be the legal team. It can't just be the policy team. It can't just be the engineers. It has to be, you know, an effect of getting different um, guidance from each of the teams. And I think as hard as it is to be a woman in the law and a policymaker in the law, it's also as hard to be a woman engineer and a woman um, data analyst and, and such. So being able to think with these women on different ideas and get different exchanges um, for us, we work a lot on spectrum, and that's not something that I know from law school. I don't know what gigahertz band is this and what, you know, what are the different frequencies, but being able to find confidants in other teams and really interact to learn this, it helps with policy and legal skills because now you have an understanding of really what you're negotiating and it helps them understand from like a policy perspective, these are what we're looking at, this is the information um, you need. So I think it's definitely a combination of, you know, knowing what you know, but also making sure you are working with those who are the technical experts, because it's, again, it's hard to be a woman in the law and woman in policy, but those who are doing engineering um, and such really, really help close the gap. Hmm. Vanessa, do you have something to add? Yeah, I would just say that, um, you know, especially being in house, uh, you have to be a creative solutioner in order to be successful in house. And in order to be a creative solutioner, you have to be, you have to understand the business on some level. Um, I think, you know, in house lawyers have are not the same as they were 20 years ago, uh, when I started practicing law. And I think you're really we're business advisors that have legal skill sets. And in order to do that successfully, you really have to understand the technology on some level. I'm not a technologist on any level. In fact, IT is my best friend because I can't do anything for myself. <laughs> Thank goodness for good IT organizations. But I will say that, you know, um, I do go in and, and I tell my team this all the time, you know, wow them with your willingness to an interest in the technology. Because usually when I ask questions about the technology, they kind of look at me like, why do you want to know that? You know, aren't you the lawyer? Aren't you the GC? And I'll say to them, how am I going to manage risk and understand what my team needs to do if I don't understand the technology at a very high level at least, right? So I would say when you show, even as a woman in the field, they don't expect you to know, which is another problem. But when you ask the question, if you don't know like me, um, there's a lot of respect that you gain from that, so. 
Yeah, I'm hearing also, um, at least in Alicia and um, Vanessa, your comments specifically, um, the importance of allyship among different groups within within the company, like uh, finding people that you can trust to ask questions of and who you know will give you the answers, for example, um, um, or other people who need your help as well. So. Um, uh, so do you think there's something specific about the tech nature of your companies um, that makes DNI issues particularly critical or particularly difficult to address? Um, so I have to say, I'm thinking about Facebook, Alicia. <laughs> <laughs> um, th thinking a little bit about, um, about its, you know, very very public nature um but we could just think about platforms more generally whether the, the new technological era has um and and the uh and the ubiquity of it has it made it um more critical more difficult how do you, how does it work um for you to addressing dni issues within your company i think it really yeah i think the tech the tech field is really interesting just because of you know, the different things that are coming up, whether it is spatial recognition issues or, you know, what are what are people using tech for and tracking, not necessarily in Facebook, just tech on the on the global scale. But I think that within tech companies, whether it's at Facebook or other tech companies, having teams that focus on these issues, um, we have a, a diversity and initiatives teams, but we also have different stakeholders that are outside of Facebook that are weighing in on different decisions that are independent of Facebook. But I think what's really important is not just coming out on, you know, certain holidays or certain um, days of recognition for diversity uh, and inclusion, but it being ingrained in your company's mission. So whether it's through the hiring process all the way up to the decision making, if you're saying that, you know, you want to increase diversity, where are you going in terms of the recruitment? Um, a lot of times you hear there's a lack of certain racial groups in engineering, but is there, or is it that you're just not actively recruiting them? Is there that lack in the field of law or are you not actively recruiting? Do you have recruiters who all look like one person or is it a representative of different groups? So I think that um, by Facebook's way of really diversifying their diversity team and it being at different levels from recruiting all the way up to, you know, pol policy makers or those in the legal team, diversity and inclusion is definitely addressed. But then of course, it's not just on the recruiting side, it is those who are working on the team. So like, there's a lot of different, like within our product design and such, there are a lot of um, different teams that are working on that, but engineers who focus on racial issues, those who are taking into, you know, so uh, socioeconomic um, status and backgrounds, whether it's in a developing nation um, or developed nations, just having a lot of diversity looking into whatever um, the different tech platforms are. So it sounds like you're saying that even within whether designer, des design group, that DNI is integrated into that expertise. So um, it's it's not it's not something that comes from the outside necessarily, but it's it's part of the work that those designers do. Exactly, and whether it's in your job fields or not, I mean, we have a lot of different um, resource and affinity groups. And for instance, if there's somebody who's working on a product design, but you're working on it for the African American community. You're, you don't have to be African American to be working on it, but if you have a whole affinity group or a resource group, a lot of times it's people posting in these groups saying, hey, can I get your opinion on this? Is this something that you think for this specific community? Does this, do these emojis look correct? What is the different, you know, um, are these different representatives of different hairstyles and different looks? And it's just really, really keen into thinking how what does the group that we're trying to serve, how is this going to be received? And a lot of times you hear like different stories, whether it's with like IP issues or different HR issues in major companies. And you're thinking, how did this get out there? This is like the legal team looked at this. Everybody looked at it, but who looked at it? Like at what lens did a woman look at it? Did somebody from that group look at it? So I think it's just really important that it's not about diversity, making sure you have 25% of another racial group or this, but really let's say it's 
100% of the same race looking at one issue, but making sure within your company, you have it ingrained where you can use different resources and it be you know representative of the demographic group that you're serving. So of course, Facebook has the benefit of being a gigantic company and also sure. <laughs> expert at communication technology in many ways to collect all that information. Juliana, you work for a much smaller company. Um, what does the um, is there something about the tech nature of your company or um, or how do you do you have a, a very different experience of the, how to address DNI issues within a small company like yours? Yeah, so right now I'm in a small company. I've been in the big companies as well, where you know there was a much more organized way of addressing um, you know diversity and inclusion. Um, right now, I'm I'm the only legal person in this company, and part of and you know a lot of tech companies don't have legal people at all that work inside their companies. Um, so it it sort of there. Let's just say it could cut both ways for smaller companies because if you have someone in there who actually is wanting to make that difference. So, for example, you know, I as the general counsel can do a lot for the culture and for the direction that our that our company should be taking. Um, so, you know, and I say that you know, general counsels and other lawyers inside of the company really are the guardians of the company's culture and their values. So they are the guardian of the company's culture and their values. Seriously, I can't stress this enough. What, what do we do in a small company? I might be a small company right in a small company right now, but we're trying to put this, you know, SOC 2 compliance security, um, you know, certification in place right now. And in order for us to do that, we have to be a better company, meaning even though we only have 20 people in them, it, it, in the company, we have to put together our code of conduct. We have to, you know, make sure that we have policies in place for diversity and inclusion, that, you know, we're going to hire the right types of people within our company to do the work, um, to call attention to things that can be done better. This is where in smaller companies, sometimes you can make a bigger difference in a shorter period of time. So that, that's the one thing that I will say about, you know, about working in a small company that's great. Vanessa, do you have something to add about the tech nature of your company that makes DNI issues particularly critical or difficult? Yeah, I think it's interesting. So the company I'm at now is sort of in between Facebook and Juliana's company. We're in hyper growth mode, growing like doubling in size. I don't know, it feels like every day, to be honest with you. So we're at like 1,400 people right now, but really aggressive um, hiring goals. And so I think we're, I feel like I'm just coming into the organization. I've been there for three weeks. Um, actually, this is the end of week four. So I feel like I'm sort of in a position where I can have an impact because I have, you know, you have that free 60 days to kind of say whatever you want to say. And then, and then you have to kind of fit in and do your job or not fit in and do your job, but do your job. Um, so th there we are building and growing. And I think that, um, Alicia said something about, you know, there's a, you hear a lot, well, it's really hard to find can diverse candidates, or it's really hard to find women candidates, women engineers to fill these roles. And I challenge that too. And I say, well, is it really hard to your point, or is that you're not looking in the right places? Or more importantly, um, and to speak to the earlier panel, when Sujun said, um, was talking about the use of executive presence, um, it really struck me because I use that all the time and I talk to my team about it, you know, I want you to work on your executive presence and it never occurred to me that my lens of executive presence was probably the white male lens of executive presence. Um, so I'm going to be more conscious of that, but in thinking about it in this context right as you're hiring you look at well there aren't enough good candidates are they are they not good or do they not fit what your mold is of a good candidate for that particular role. Um, and I think that's hard. To do and you know the Salonis is um, growing and it came it's a European based company and we have a lot of work to do around diversity and inclusion but I think if you have senior leadership voices and I think legal is well positioned for that Juliana I agree with you who push the issue and make it important and I, I have really um, partnered with our head of HR and he's very focused on this as well um, as you think about recruiting and you know board growth and all of these important steps for a mid-sized pre-IPO company, there's so much opportunity to make change. So I think, um, you know, we're growing at a hyper growth mode in a, in a, in a time where everybody's focused on um, diversity and inclusion in a really good way. And I think it gives us opportunity to have a bigger impact. 
So what you just said, um, and you corrected yourself, you spit in and, um, and yeah. do your job, but I, I, it reminds me of something you said when we were talking um, pre-conference about there being opt maybe optimal moments in one's mm -hmm. job, um, either position or time or the time of the company particularly. And we think about tech companies like growing very rapidly, like you said, or being acquired or um, like the, the innovation ecosystem being so, um, so fast paced that maybe mm -hmm. we could think a little bit about how one can critically intervene um, to, to do the good work that Juliana was talking about, to be the model. Um, and when are those times? Like, have you in your experience, and I'll, I'll go back to you, Vanessa, because I remember you talking about this specifically. Um, uh, when in your experience have you felt like they were opportune moments um, in, uh, to, to intervene, to produce DNI results that were you know, exceptional or you were proud of or um, you felt could, were long lasting? Yeah, so I think there's no rule around this. I think it depends on the organization and um, your level within that organization, because sometimes you have more of an opportunity to influence. But um, so we were talking about this in the context of kind of when I was interviewing for the job, you know, is that the right time to say something or to ask about it? Or do you wait until you get on board and then you have more of an ability to have an impact? Um, and I think I definitely asked about it when I was hired, when I was um, interviewing for this job, because it's something that was really important to me in making a jump from where I was to where I was going. And I didn't want to enter a new company that wasn't focused on this and wasn't thinking about it. Um, and so part of the reason that I came is because, you know, they are focused on it and they are committed to it. And I thought that I could be a part of that. Um, so that was a good opportunity for me. Now that I'm here, I'm going to hold them to it. Right. So now I have a different opportunity, which is. I have influence, I'm building my team right now. So I have an opportunity to set an example and how I build my team and who I hire. Um, and I talk to our recruiting organization all the day, all the, all the time and say, you know, like, how are we thinking about this? When you're talking to the sales organization and the engineering organizations, which are growing much more exponentially than mine is, um, how are we, what are we doing to make sure that we are um, ha looking at hiring through this lens? Um, and they are, and I think, you know, I have to give them a lot of credit. They are thinking about this and everything that they do, but I think I have an opportunity now to hold them to it. So hyper growth is a great kind of window in terms of the scale. I think um, what Juliana was saying is when you're really tiny, small, you know, adding one person that doesn't look like everybody else at a 20 person company can make a huge impact. And then you continue to grow hopefully um, in that way. Yeah, I mean, we could be thinking about hiring as well as we could think be thinking about structure, right? Yeah. As how to how to implement certain structures within a company. Um, so um, stay those may or may not have sticking power, and they may not people might not buy into them. But I, I'd be interested to hear if people also have experiences in their company where new new systems were in place that um, uh, maybe because of the nature of the tech company or just because um, of the interest in promoting those values where um, there were particular times when that was an opportune intervention. Um, Alicia, do you have anything to say about that? Yeah, I'm not sure if necessarily something was um, put in place, but one thing that I really, really appreciate is we have town halls um, and I think sometimes when it comes to the size of the company, it's so much easier to do things. But I know personally, the fact that, um, so Mark Zuckerberg has these town hall uh, weekly uh, meetings with all of um, the employees and we get to you know put in questions and then they're rated up like by your colleagues um, to those that are addressed. And I think it's really crucial in times where there are a lot of different issues, whether like diversity inclusion issues or just things that are reflected in um, the media or just current events, right? Things that are happening in different groups, whether it um, be with women or affinity groups and, and such like that, having that floor um, to be able to ask questions, but also really be held accountable to, uh, to address these questions. I don't think it's something that, you know, every CEO wants to do or has to do, um, but having that, option of being able to answer, ask your questions and having your colleagues um, show their allyship basically by uprooting it or, or, or stick up for you. I think that's something that definitely helps um, in a culture where some people don't feel heard or seen. Mm. 
Yeah, the town hall model I see being adopted actually more widely um, in other companies. Juliana, how is it for you um, in terms of thinking about particular moments to address these DNI issues in your small company or in previous? Yeah, so I, I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about some of the previous experiences that I've had at bigger companies because to me, um, it all depends on who are who's the management team and who's in power, if you know what I mean. And I think I talked about it when we started talking, when we talked before that, um, you know, when I was at Donna Bradstreet as their chief privacy officer, we had, um, you know, we had an event where the company that was public for 170 something years was taken private by a private equity firm and everything that was built up with respect to our plans for diversity and inclusion and you know unconscious bias training and you know really a culture what i felt was kind of caring got taken away and it was really a difficult time and and you know and, and this is where i kind of want to talk a little bit about resources and what you know the, the the hard part for a lot of companies big or small is the bottom line <laughs> and vanessa and i have talked about this too is that you know when when a company you know how much however hard you might fight for it doesn't want to put the money into you know, building out a diversity and inclusion program, and not just even a program, walking the walk, talking the talk, that's really difficult. And that's a difficult company to stay in. I mean, although I will say that, you know, I, my proud moment there, there really was as their chief privacy officer, I had built up a team of six women that uh, around the world that reported into me, you know, from India, um, China, UK, and, and it, it was great. I, I felt like on the legal team side, we were light years ahead of what was happening in some of the rest of the company when the private equity team came in. And that, and it was, it was hard, but it's all about modeling and it's all about who has the voice. And that's what Michelle was saying earlier, who has the voice? You, you know, I had the, vo I had a voice as the chief privacy officer to be talking to the president of, you know, our international company to say, listen, you know, we need to do more here. And, and, you know, he was starting to listen and this was the private equity president. So, you know, but, but I, I guess part of what's difficult about being in-house in, in companies is that the tide can turn and you don't have much control over that tide turning sometimes. So that's why when you're even when in, in a smaller company, it's actually a little bit easier sometimes to make some of those baby steps and some of the bigger steps, uh, you know, reality to kind of, you know, create that culture of, of diversity and inclusion or to start it at least, you know, even though you don't have the money, you can at least have the mindset is what I say. Yeah, it's um what, something that jumped out. I'm gonna go to some of the questions in the queue because they um, interact with what we've been talking about. But um, there, there is a. I don't think it's in necessarily only tech companies, but of course it's not. But the, the international nature of some of the collaborative collaboration and spin-off of so many of these tech companies, I think, produces a a kind of a, a maybe a unique challenge to um, to to DNI issues. Uh, when you think about, um, you know, what what Alicia was talking about, emojis, for example, or language recognition, or I mean, whatever, or facial recognition, the kind of questions that these, or what private, how privacy is managed, and it's cultural, right? And so, um, there is something, there may be something specific about the challenges of DNI issues in a tech in tech companies that are inherently international, the way you were just describing. And so, I wanted to pin that maybe. Um, but uh, so two questions from the chat that um, I don't know this term process mining. So Vanessa, <laughs> you appear to already. Know, so are there one question? Are there process mining technology already applied to DNI achievement or goals? So that's the first question, and that I feel like that may be related to Amanda Goodrum's question about um, uh, uh, about how drawing on the, um, the the documentary coded bias that points out how lack of diversity can have a huge um, impact sort of a viral impact on how technologies adopt, are adopted and adapted um, how do we make dni a key part of risk analysis that is you really need to get it early before the technology gets away from you and becomes a standard 
Um, and that does feel like something um, about how to manage it at the early stages. Um, but now, so what, what is process mining technology and how does that work? Yeah, so so Solonis is a process mining company, which Hi. is why I think this question, so somebody Googled us or somebody knew us, which is awesome, <laughs> I love it. Um, so, and, and what it is, is essentially, you know, it's a technology that it's artificial intelligence that goes into systems, pulls data out and does an analytics around it. Um, and so it can be applied across all sorts of things. So I love this. And I think, you know, we're building out the corporate social responsibility team, which includes DNI and everything else. And I, I um, and so this will be used because you can go into your HR systems, of course, and pull data out and see how you're doing. Um, how are you doing today as your baseline and then how you're doing later. So I'll come back next year and talk about how much progress we've made <laughs> over the course of the next 12 months. Meow. So you can count I me in for that. Is, so process, the process mining, it, it's, it's not data mining? No, so it, it gener it's, it's more about, um, so let me give you a non DNI example. Um, there are uh, order to cash processes. So in finance, right, you, the system brings an order in and it goes through all sorts of steps before the, the uh, uh, software shipped, okay? That's what, or manufacturing, whatever it is that your company builds. So it goes in and finds out where's the gap in the process. I see. And then automates how to fix that. So, so you can that, apply it across anything. Oh, I see. So, it, so the question here is, can it be applied to DNI achievement? And the answer is obviously yes, but those sure. are, those are um, less quant DNI achievement, as we have already been talking, is not only quantitative metrics but qualitative metrics as well. That must be right. a much harder thing to um, to produce a you know a function or a value of, and that definitely gets to the second question about um, you know how when when tech companies are they're not inherently automated of the creating automated machines, but if we we think about the way they scale and, and the value of their scalability. Um, being largely about automated processes, one can uh, one can imagine that the risk assessment in, in not catching the DNI problems early can be huge. Um, and uh, uh, do do you do? I mean, either Juliana in your company or um, Alicia, have you had experience in this? Is at what point in the process of new um, new workflow do the DNI questions get get raised, or is it always, or how does that work? To me, it's always. I mean, it's an ongoing conversation that needs to be had, really. And right now in our company, you know, we have been purposely talking, purposefully talking about adding a female to our to our uh, board of directors. And right now that we have five five board of directors, they're all males. They all, you know, have known each other for a long time. Most of them, you know what I mean? Um, and it's that old boy network. And in technology companies, it's even worse, especially the smaller startups. They all kind of know each other. And then I'm in data services and it's all the same people that you see again and again. So um, so the good news is, is that, you know, our uh, the founders of, of my company are actually really, they're twin brothers, but they're really, really engaged with this. They want to do it. Um, and as all of you might know is that you know there there are there's more and more um talk about boardroom diversity legislation that's going on uh california i think was the first um state to actually pass a law about boardroom le legislation and that was uh, boardroom diversity and that was really only for public companies but massachusetts has a proposed law on the book right now as well and it really is sort of guidelines based on the fact that you know if you have a board of directors of five you should have at least one or you know um, female or or someone you know from an underrepresented community that's part of your board and you know why and we all know why it's you know that's what we need to bring to the table here there's you need that point of view alicia did you want to add anything yeah, just in terms of, I mean, I think similar to what I said earlier, like, um, and I agree with Juliana, it, it's at all stages where um, just from product design, uh, one of my friends recently started working on Facebook and he was brought in to work on the product design side of dealing with, um, you know, racial bias and implications of certain products and being able to give a different perspective. So I think it's, you know, when you have things like that, and then you're all of our products go through different like legal and, and, and legal assessments and policy assessments and such. So when you're starting with a product that already has um, that type of consideration being taken from, from the beginning, it, it's just a, a core part of um, the work. And then I think also 
similar to what we're talking about with boards, like uh, Facebook does have um, an independent oversight board. And if you look at those who are compromised, and you know, that was to address certain concerns in the first place. But if you look at who was on those boards, it's very diverse. And again, diversity in experience, I, diversity in um, fields and diversity um, in terms of uh, groups of, you know, different racial and ethnicity groups. But I think it's, one an important thing for a company to even consider is what is their definition of diversity um and then you can go from there yeah so that makes me think a little bit about um you know we, we've been talking a little bit of the size of one's company and the and the the um, challenges of growth and the opportunities of growth for example but also thinking about um about national versus international and one's one's goals towards that end um uh I mean, in, in the spirit of trying to think about sort of takeaways, um, what our audience might, it's sometimes easier to remember specific stories or specific anecdotes, or um, are there, does there, does there, is there a sense in which the, um, the national or international nature, or you've had experiences in size, small versus large in the tech space has made a difference in terms of promoting the values that we're talking about today? I can speak to that a little bit if you like. Yeah. Um, so, so I think Juliana touched on this a little bit. You know, when you're a large public company, there's a lot more pressure to focus on these issues than when you're a private company and you can kind of hide and do your thing. Um, I also think there's much more ability to focus on it. So, when you're a 20 person company and your head's down trying to just build the technology to see if you have a business, a lot of times you don't, you know, kind of look up and look around and see, wow, everybody just looks exactly like me and maybe I should think about this. Um, and there's no outside pressure to do that typically. So, it takes somebody like Juliana being in there to be like, hey guys, like look around you, you know, we need to do something about this. When you're a public company, there's a ton of pressure from the public and your stakeholders out there, no matter what. So, you know, when co public companies, all of the investment bankers are now out there saying you should have two women on your board minimum, there should be mandating um, more representation than just gender diversity, in my opinion. And I think we're going to get there. Um, so there's pressure from, uh, from that community as well. So I think it definitely does make a difference if you are um, small versus large in terms of how how fast or how hard, how hard you're going to be pushed from the outside sources to do something about it. And that's why you see programs around this at public companies and you're seeing more diversity um, on public company boards and pre-IPO companies are being told table stakes, two women on your board or you're never going to go public successfully because the because it will be you'll be called out for it. Those are, these are all good sort of outside pressures, right? In my mind, at least. It's, it's unfortunate that you have to have the outside pressures, but I think it's good that at least we have them and it's forcing a discussion around it. For sure. Juliana, yeah. do you have something to add? Yeah, I just, I just wanted to add to that. I completely agree with what Vanessa is saying, but um, you know, we have unique international issues in public companies because you know, I would say America is way, way more on the forefront of really trying to legislate and make differences in, in these areas than some other countries are. And I, I'm not talking about, you know, Australia, maybe, or, you know, even Europe, but even Europe is behind us in some of this stuff, I got to tell you. Um, but, you know, when you have international operations in China, in India, um, you know, there's a whole culture that goes along with that that's not necessarily, you know, part of, you know, whatever the American consciousness is. So it's really hard sometimes navigating not just, you know, our, you know, um, diversity and inclusion issues from like a, a U.S. point of view, but also from a cultural and, um, uh, you know, uh, really, uh, <laughs> Um, a point of view of, of different areas with their own own kinds of you know um, yeah what do you call it um, I'm just uh, blanking here but yeah it's it's really more what what does the, what does the person from China bring to the table you know what I mean that that you might not get in on uh, from the U.S. side that sees things so uniquely differently that you know for us um, so I was on the compliance team so what we would do is we would do these compliance um, investigations quote unquote and we would go actually to our various different um, 
um, you know, uh, offices in all of these different countries so that we could actually interact with people on their cultural level and they could understand what we were trying to do with them, you know, as a company with our compliance programs and why we were trying to implement the various different things that we were doing. And that worked with some in some countries, but not in other countries. So I guess my point is really more that, you know, this is a bigger, you know, issue on an international um, fr front because there's just not that much that, um, that that we can always do, quote unquote, about the actual, you know, cultures and and um, you know the, the different uh, points of view that people bring to it from various international places. So so that's actually something that gets really tricky sometimes in an international organization. I can imagine it feels. Um... You know, one can think, well, this is just the way the world is. There's all these different cultures and we have to accept it. We can talk about that way. You could also say, well, this is a choice that the company has to make. We are a U.S. company. We are sending our, our products and our services overseas and we have a certain value system that we want to instantiate. We can also think about it as a learning opportunity. If one of the company wants to do is to think about how do we understand how our consumers and our and our clients and our employees all over the world are interacting with this. But the, you, you, I mean, one of the things you've described is sort of a listening mission or a learning mission as mm -hmm. you go around the world. You can imagine a company might feel like, oh, what a lot of money this is going to cost to send all our people right. around the country, around the right. world. And so explaining or um, justifying this kind of um, learning uh, is, I think, probably really important, um, uh, important for the longevity of the company as well as anything else. Um, yeah, look, if you're not culturally, sorry, yeah, I'm not if you're not culturally aware when you're expanding your organization into other, other countries, you will fail miserably. And that is a lot, uh, financially, a lot worse than spending some money on sending teams around, you know? Um, there's also a big difference I have noticed in my experience between companies that are U.S. companies that expand globally and companies that are maybe European companies or Japanese companies or from some other um, continent that expand into the U.S. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to be very conscious of it, both working internally with employees and also in how do you go to market in those countries, because I've seen it fail. And when it fails, it's you end up in big clashes and it's not good for, for business. So again, to going back to the bottom line, when you talk to your executives about it, this is what they'll hear, right? Yeah, you have to be culturally aware. Yeah, connecting the values that we're talking about to the bottom line is always a, yeah. um, a, a successful rhetorical move. <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, you know, uh, it's, it's good when they match. Sometimes they don't match yeah, though, and right. so you'll have to choose. <laughs> Um, Alicia, did you want to add to the conversation? Yeah, no, I, I really, um, I, I agreed with both Vanessa and Juliana, um, especially what Juliana was saying in terms of, you know, having to go to different countries. My role is really specifically global. And it's not just about making sure that we understand culturally, like as a company, you will fail if you don't take these into considerations because, you know, you're, you're saying you're bringing, for instance, in Facebook, we're bringing more people online. But if as a US company, all your products are like in English, for instance, you're, you, we have a digital literacy project, but we're having it in, you know, a certain country. It's not just about, is this in France, is this in French or is this in Spanish? Like, what is the local dialect of that specific community, right? Like if it's in Niger, if it's in Nigeria, are you talking about Yoruba? Like there's, you have to get so specific that you're taking into, into consideration who you're serving because it just doesn't work to have this you know, one product that's going to be applied to each country, even, and a lot of times people say like, okay, well, we'll apply this in LATAM or we'll apply this in Africa. And we're talking about regions, not countries. These are, these are such, even within one country, it's, it's such a different dynamic that you, that you have to go through. And I think, yes, it's about learning from them, but I know with our regional teams, we have people from there and, and, and you, you think about let's serve these regions, but part of like diversity and inclusion is, as a global country, it's not just, hey, let's make sure that there's more women in the US, there's more African-Americans in the US. If we're you know, serving somewhere in Brazil, like you should have local Brazilians who you're hiring. And a lot of times I know um, when I was at Northeastern, I did the dual program at Brandeis for sustainable international development. And most of 
my classmates were from other countries. And one issue that they had when they were graduating was these are these are people who are way more skilled than I was. They had the on the ground experience, but it was the visa issues, not being able, companies not sponsoring, you know, these visas and them having not being able to work. So it's like we're talking about diversity and inclusion, but what are the steps being taken from companies? Are you willing to cover some of these costs and sponsorships to make sure that you have those who are who are skilled and who are you know, best suited to really do the job. Um, but it, it really, really is a, a global initiative. And yes, there are certain companies, but as you get bigger and bigger, it's really important to see what are the other considerations? And are we only talking about diversity inclusion within this box that we know, or are we taking a, a global lens on it? So I'm gonna I'm gonna elaborate on what you just said, but I'll um, urge the panelists to look at the next question in the chat um, about concrete examples. One of the things, um, Alicia, you were just talking about made me think that um, one of the interesting aspects of tech companies is I think we have come to expect technology to be very specific to our own needs and our own experiences. That technology is adaptable and it's specific, and when it when it travels, it's going to it's going to be be specific to that region or that person and that we can personalize all of this stuff. And so of course with the all with that being one of the affordances of technological services and devices, um, we we do need to be more attentive to that specificity, peoples and communities and and think about its resiliency. And so one of uh, I mean, I, I have been following tech companies who not only hire technologists, of course, but they hire anthropologists and they hire linguists and they hire sociologists, for example, and they hire urban urban ecologists. They're trying to figure out how the products can be made in different parts of the world. And so we think about what, what it is to run a tech company successfully. We have to be thinking of interdisciplinarily about what that means and also, I mean, one of the great feminist tenets, you know, from the from the eighties and nineties, is about every is about the specificity of personal experience and um, and what you're describing actually is is how for technology to really techno, technology companies to succeed globally, they have to su succeed locally, um, and that requires that requires very specific understanding, which goes well beyond the technology. It go, it's to the social and sociological and anthropological aspects of the community you're engaging with, and that means, of course, tech law is not only computer science and engineering, right? It's it's about about specifics of humanity, and that I think that's exciting. But you know, a lot of a uh, lot of companies, I can imagine, freaking out about that. Um, so, um, so the question um, is: Can the panelists give some concrete examples uh, or experiences of differences on DNI issues when working internationally? Um, so, I think Alicia, you just gave a little bit of an example from um, from the the experience about linguists. Does anybody else have um, concrete examples of? The challenges working internationally um, on DNI issues. It could be the role of women. It could be what privacy means, for example. Um, it could be, uh, I mean, uh, what forms of reg financial regulation, I imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think what it, just tagging on what I said before, and I think it's interesting with a Facebook technology company where you're really consumer based, it's a different, it's different than when you're in kind of a B2B technology business in terms of how you approach things, but just internationally, um, you know, so, so I was a GC at a, a company that was a subsidiary of a Japanese company. And, the, and so the Japanese business culture is very different from the American business culture. Um, and so when you are, thinking about things like diversity and inclusion, um, they look differently and they're treated differently here than they are in Japan, for example. So, you know, we went to board meetings in Japan and um, I was very often the only woman in the entire room, if not certainly the most senior woman um, and in a room of about 40 people, right? So it's, you know, that that is a barrier that is different in Japan than it is here. And so, but you you can't approach it. It's it's thought of differently in Japan than it is in the United States, for example, right? So you can't go in with a U.S. approach um, in every country because you, again you'll fail. So that goes back to sort of the cultural awareness. And um, you know, just to give an example, there was one woman that um, from our parent company that was a senior person that you know became um, part of the team that was working with us. 
Um, and I was so happy to see her and like, you know, we, we all went to some event or something and I kind of pulled her aside and I said, so talk to me about what it's like in your role because she was relatively senior and being promoted and she was incredibly smart. And we talked a lot about that. And it was just, it was, it was then I came back to, you know, my our organization in the US and I was like, let's work more with her. Let's, you know, she's really smart. I talked to her about X, Y, and Z and, you know, she's on the technology side. So um, she knew more than I did, obviously, but I was like, mate, you know, let's bring her into this working group. Let's, let's do this. And so that was, but you have to be careful, right? Because you can't, there are different cultural norms um, in different countries. And if you don't respect that, it can backfire on you. So that was, that was definitely a challenge that I faced. Um, and I tried to find a way to handle it without, you know, completely blowing up or making it more difficult for her, frankly, uh, in the end. Example. It's a great example. Juliana, do you have a story? Yeah, I, well, I had one colleague who reported into me who was really the, the chief privacy and compliance person in China, and um, she worked very closely with the, the manager there. And, um, you know, the culture there is very different, just like, you know, Vanessa was saying in Japan that, you know, the business culture, the person who is the manager of that particular, you know, division is really seen as, you know, a godlike figure, I would say, not godlike, that's a little bit over the top, but, you know, you, you have deference to that person, they're a senior person to you. And sometimes it's hard to bring up those risk factors and the compliance related issues that come up um in that way so i had to work with her on strategies for you know how to talk to this management person um and um really bring into play the the you know the, this making it really more about risks rather than you know stature quote unquote you know within within the company and that was that was difficult uh, but we did work we did work it out um but and then the other thing i would say for an example is that you know the the compliance hotline that we had in place we had such different um types of things that came through that compliance hotline in various different you know uh, countries that we were that that it was almost it, it almost gave us sort of a um um, a roadmap to figure out how to go back to those particular, uh, you know, sites and, and do some training on various different things having to do with diversity inclusion, because those complaints that came in on the hotline really showed what was working and what wasn't working. And, you know, all of it is about, you know, your code of conduct and making sure that everybody within your international com company is actually complying with it. And, and, and that can be challenging. And so it was, it was very eye-opening to see, or even the lack of complaints coming in is eye-opening yeah. to see sometimes. You That's know? so interesting. So, so, so there, there's a sort of information gathering that you then yes. have to analyze um, and, and um, you can't be afraid to collect all that information or discount some. You can imagine easily discounting some as not being relevant, but that's um, well, yeah. You need to draw some conclusions from the fact that some things are not coming in. You know, stuff is going on, and you're not hearing about it. So that's excellent, Alicia. Did you have anything to add? No, no. I think uh, I mean I completely agree. And like I was saying before, in terms of like the different languages, I know internally when we're thinking about um, different like compliance trainings and managing bias trainings. Um, I think previously in my career, I I just always thought of like, hey, this is a you know, something that applies to us in the US. And I, I didn't really think about what the global, what are the global different compliance regulations we're looking into when we're talking about like diversity and inclusion compared to if it has to do with like regulations or something for the business. But I appreciate that now when I'm doing um, trainings at work, a lot of it is focused. Like when we sign up for training, sometimes it'll say, what region are you in? And I think a lot of things are based specifically taking into consideration on different specifics of where you are, whether it's, you know, you're in EMEA or you're here in like um, North America and such. But I think also when it's global conferences, I've, I've learned how people have taken into consideration just the things that are going on um, for instance, when it was Ramadan and I was at a global conference, there was like not instructions, but more so guidance on um, how it was differently when we were eating lunch for that conference, you know, taking into consideration what your colleagues um, were doing and just just different um, 
things to consider for different regions and for different groups that maybe in the US you won't necessarily acknowledge if you just happen to have one or two um, people from a certain country. And so I just, I appreciate that on a global scale, different companies are now really thinking more and more what is my company, who is my company comprised of and how can we, you know, take in those considerations? Yeah, thinking more broadly who we are, you know, including, yeah, that, um, that's important. So um, it's, it's about time for questions from the audience. Um, and I, and we've been getting some over the chat. And as people queue up, I, I don't know, are we, are we raising hands? Is that how we're doing it? Or just putting your name in the chat and yell? Um, I thought you could maybe pick out a question or two that you maybe haven't already addressed and just have someone unmute and ask it themselves. And if you have a question now and you want to dive in, you could. Uh, also I think we've I think we've answered all the questions in the okay. chat. All right. Um, You're phenomenal. You're very fast. Yeah, um, but um, I, I, there is a question that we as people are thinking about whether they want to probe these um, brilliant women further. There, there's a there's a question we talked about that I thought was particularly interesting and helpful from my own perspective, which is the kind of um, company practices or professional organizations you engage in to build your community of allies and network of expertise. That is, if we think about the first question we started with, which is, um, you know, whether tech law is particularly um, gendered or um, alienating for people, um, how do you, you know, where do you go to build your expertise? Where do you find your allies within the company and outside of the company? Where do you go um, so that you feel capable of achieving the goals that you want to achieve within your company? So that, I'd like to maybe do one round of that with the group as people maybe queue up questions. Uh, Juliana, do you want to start that? Yeah, so for me, it was really um, the biggest organization that really has been a help for me is um, the um, International Association for Privacy Professionals. It is a phenomenal organization that, you know, everybody who's at all interested in privacy should really look into. <laughs> um, there are many women in the privacy and compliance field, by the way, and it's and I, and more diversity that I've seen too. And you do not need to be a legal professional, even to be in that field. So it's it's really um, great. I will I'll put some uh, a link to it in in the chat when when I stop talking. Um, but and then you know the other thing I wanted to talk about is being a mentor to others in this space because you know I'm part of this community uh, mentoring it's the, it's the tiered community mentoring program that the Mass Bar Association does and it's such a great program because what it does is it, is it teams up um, lawyers with um, law students and with high school students and it's all about you know legal professions and legally related professions so that you know folks can get an understanding of what who does what in the area and i've had some really great mentees that have come to me through there that i've and and some of them have been northeastern people as well and this particular conference is also an, is one i think that's great for you know being able to reach out to each other so i would i would definitely you know tell people if you want to link in with me i'm, I'm happy to be you know helpful in any which way to help you to you know uh, to get into tech and um and uh you know this particular area so anyway so that was just my little spiel there okay we have we have like three or four more minutes alicia do you want to add some organizations or allyship groups yeah, I mean, within the company, we again, we have these affinity groups, whether it's women at um, black at um, it's pride at so whatever there, if there's a group that you associate with, whether it be racially based or just interest that you have. Um, those are great mentorship opportunities. I also personally, in terms of like growth for like policy and legal legal growth, there's the Federal um, Communications Bar Association, which just deals with you know communications. And these are um, lawyers who have been in this field and it's been very helpful to just see from the government perspective and the private sector um, perspective, exactly what's going on as well as on the international um, level. There's like within the, International Telecommunications Union, which is like a specialized um, body of the UN. They have a group now focused specifically for women to exchange ideas. And it's been amazing just connecting with different engineers all over the world for certain issues that we're all going to be negotiating for. And so that has been useful. But just lastly, I think the Newsville community has been really, really great. I got into this field 
my co-op um, at the FCC, um, the deputy um, bureau chief in the International Bureau, she's a Northeastern graduate. And when I got there, she really, you know, took me under her wing and like showed me the ropes. And I think without that, it, it, it just wouldn't have went the same. And then just now, um, BALSA, when I see um, the Black Law Student Association alumni group, a lot of times they just, you know, send out emails. I haven't had to use them because I'm in this career, but it's like, hey, is anybody looking for this? Does anybody have a re referral for that? And it's just great knowing that, you know, the law school you went to, you can get community, you can get those um, different uh, relationships and referrals there as well. Vanessa, you want to have the last word? Ooh. Um... So all of those are amazing. I think I rely a lot on um, Tech GC and Boston GC, which is just a network of GCs. I think Juliana, we cross paths there um, sometimes uh, where you can talk about anything and I found it to be really useful. There's great panels, there's great expertise and there's a women subgroups within the Tech GC or organization too that um, you, know, you can bounce off and say, what are you guys doing about you know, diversity and inclusion? What are you doing about um, COVID? What are you doing about whatever it is that you're, you're facing. So I rely on that a lot these days. Great. Um, it is 1225. I, I with I don't know what Miel and Amy want to do about questions or I, I think what? I think that you took a lot of them throughout the program. So you are very yeah. adept at what you do. I can tell you you teach. Yes. <laughs> um, Amy, did you want to do Okay. Yeah, thank you so much to all the panelists. This was an excellent panel. So much, uh, so much great information. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And, um, and Professor Silby, thanks for moderating. You were fantastic. As Miel pointed out, you're very, very nimble, clearly very experienced at this. And um, we miss you at Northeastern, but we're happy to have you back uh, for this conference. Always so. glad to be back for Women in the Law. Always. Yeah, thanks so much for doing it. Thank you all and enjoy Thank the rest you. of the conference.